Um, everyone, um, welcome to uh, worship Sunday worship service. And thank you for those who are in person here. It's great to see all the faces. And, and for those online, thank you for joining us and, and uh, um, really gathering as a community to worship our God. Uh, you know, this week we probably witnessed some of the most uh, maybe sad as well as uh, disturbing things. Um, but in light of that, I thought we would just read this prayer, Psalm 46, as a prayer for us and for our nation um, as we uh, start our service together. So let's, let's rise. And this is uh, from Psalm 46. Uh, we'll read from verse 1 to 3. Let's read it in unison as well as uh, verse 6 and 7. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roam and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, Selah. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So we can trust that our, our kingdom is ruled by the God who loves us and God is in complete control and God who is righteous. And that's where our citizenship lies. So let's begin our worship. And as we, uh, <clears throat> our, uh, as, we, as we come to our God in prayer, Father, we thank you. Thank you for... Um, gathering us. Thank you that we can gather under you, um, knowing that you are a sovereign God and you are a loving Father. So we come to you knowing that you love us and you, you, you want us to come before you and, and uh, you love our worship. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and our King. Amen. Let's sing to our great God and King. Cornerstone, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness.
the storm. He is Lord of all. Amen. We thank you, God, that you continue to show your grace and your mercy. And that we can know that you are a good and faithful God and a good and faithful Father.
prayer to the God of our life. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us. Oh God, we thank you. We praise you. We glorify you. And we know, we know, we know that you are a good, good God and a good, good Father. Lord, we thank you that you are in our midst always, that you hold us in the palm of your hand and the apple, we are the apple of your eye. You call us friends, you call us children washed in the blood of your son. And one day we will stand faultless before you and you do not see our sin and you will not see our sin. Oh God, have mercy and continue to have mercy and grace on us in this praise and worship service, God, as we hear your word. And I we pray, God, for the ministry of the word bring, brought before us, Lord, that we would be mindful continuing to look to Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Hi, kids, and welcome to Children's Ministry Time. Today, we're going to be discussing Catechism number 51. So the question for catechism number 51 is, of what advantage to us is Christ's ascension? Let's read that out loud together. Of what advantage to us is Christ's ascension? And the answer is Christ is now advocating for us in the presence of his father and also sends us his spirit. Why don't we all read that out loud together? Christ is now advocating for us in the presence of his father and also sends us his spirit. So if you look at this question and answer, there's three big words, and they all start with the letter A. There's ascension, advocating, and advantage. Three big words that all start with A. So what we're going to do today to learn about Catechism 51 is we're going to go through those words and to learn about Jesus's ascension, how he advocates for us, and what advantage that brings for us. But before we get started, let me ask you guys a question. Maybe it's something you've thought about or something you've been asked before. What do you wanna be when you grow up? Well, maybe some people out there wanna become an astronaut and fly up super high in the sky in a spaceship. Maybe some of you wanna become attorneys. This represents a gavel, something that you see in a courtroom to bring order. Or maybe some of you want to become athletes, like a professional tennis player. Well, these professions all start with the letter A, astronaut, attorney, and athlete. But more importantly, they're going to help us learn what these other three words mean with respect to today's catechism about ascension, advocating, and advantage. So let's start with ascension. Christ ascended into heaven after being resurrected. After Christ died and was resurrected, he ascended into heaven to be seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Could you just picture that and how amazing that is? This is just Buzz Lightyear, but just picture in your mind Christ ascending into heaven and what a powerful image that is. But it doesn't end there. Christ is now in heaven, and he's seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
And he, you know what he's doing up there? He's advocating for us. So advocating or to advocate means to support or to defend. Just like an attorney, an attorney defends somebody in a courtroom to a judge. So not only did Christ die for our sins, but today he's still advocating for us. When we sin, when we do things that are bad, you know, we're already forgiven for our sins, but Christ is still in heaven next to God praying for us and advocating for us to God. So we have an amazing savior who uh, ascended into heaven, is advocating on our behalfs to God. What a real advantage. An advantage is something that makes you better off. And so not only is Christ ascended into heaven and advocating for us, but we also have the Holy Spirit within us here on earth. So we have Christ in heaven and the Holy Spirit living within us. What an advantage. So, you know, there are some athletes who are really good at, let's say, physically hitting a tennis ball. There are some special athletes who have a real advantage. And some people describe it as they have something deep inside of them that gives them that extra edge and that allows them to play under pressure um, their very best. What an advantage. So, Let's review what we learned about this catechism. First, we learned that Christ ascended into heaven to be seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And there today, to this day, he is advocating on our behalf. He's praying for us and pleading for us with God. And lastly, what an advantage we still have, even though Christ is in heaven and not with us here right now on earth, we have the Holy Spirit living with us. What an advantage. So with that, um, why don't we learn and discuss today's scripture reading? So today's scripture reading comes from Romans, Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God who indeed is interceding for us. All right, so why don't I pray for us and then we'll close. Dear Father God, we thank you for teaching us about Catechism 51. We thank you, Lord, for the almighty value, the precious importance of Christ's ascension into heaven and what that means and that Jesus is still advocating for us right now as we speak. Whether we sin or do anything wrong, we have an ultimate advocate through Jesus in heaven. And we're so grateful, Lord, for the advantage of Jesus and the Holy Spirit living within us. And we're so grateful, Lord, for this catechism. And we pray that you teach us just and remind us of the importance of Jesus' ascension and what that means for us in our lives. We thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Great. Thank you, Johnny, for the, uh, the catechism and for teaching um, children as well as the adults. Right now is the time for announcements. Uh, my name is Tim. I'm, uh, I'm a member at New Hope and uh, we're just going to go through a few announcements. First of all, uh, please join us for the in-person worship service, um, allowing up to 40 people to attend. We'll also be celebrating communion next week, immediately following the service. And again, at 4.30, for those who are not able to come to the in-person worship service, um, online registration for both services opens each Monday. Next, our new church software uh, called Church Community Builder 
it has officially launched. And you may notice that going forward, ministries in our church will be utilizing this software to communicate. And if you are a member or regular attender, you are able to log into the software to see what is going on in your groups and ministries that you are a part of, as well as use it as a uh, church directory. You should have received an email invitation to create a login. And if you did not, uh, please do contact Sarah Mills. Uh, her email address is there on the slide. Uh, since that means you may no longer receive church communications going forward. Um, there will also be a short training at the members meeting that will occur on uh, January 24th, where we will have a short tutorial on the software. And that being said, our next all member uh, meeting will be on January the 24th, immediately following the service. Uh, at that meeting, we'll be reviewing and voting on the annual church budget. And lastly, to, uh, to give online, please, vi please uh, visit uh, newhopefellowship.org slash donate um, if you, um, uh, to, to donate and, and to give your tithes and offerings. That's it by way of announcements. Uh, we will then um, uh, switch over to um, uh, Che for the prayer. Thanks, uh, thanks, Tim. Um, as Rob was um, um, encouraging us at, 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 during the sermon last week, one of the things that we want to do regularly is just pray together as a church. And there are two items that we want to pray for. Uh, one is uh, for uh, Maranatha Grace Church. You may remember uh, we shared a couple of months ago that they were in the process of pastoral transition. So Pastor Mike Malanga has just recently joined. Uh, in fact, uh, Pastor Rob was just there this morning. So, so he's transitioning as a, as a senior pastor at uh, Maranatha Grace. So we want to pray for, uh, for our sister church there. Uh, but we also want to pray for... Um, uh, Ryan Miller and uh, his family. Um, you may remember he preached uh, last, I think, April or May time frame. He was a pastor of our church prior to uh, Pastor Rob. Uh, their third son, Dawson, uh, who is, I think, about eight, maybe eight or nine years old, uh, has been suffering uh, with a disease called, um, let me see if I can say this, autoimmune encephalitis, which is a, a type of brain inflammation where the body's immune system attacks healthy, healthy, uh, healthy cells and tissues. Um, and it's a, um, it's a rare complex disease that can cause rapid changes, both in physical as well as mental health. And uh, so he's been suffering through this for the past, um, I believe, a couple of years. Uh, and apparently it has really turned for the, for the worse uh, last, um, last week or so. And so he'll be going through additional tests uh, tomorrow. So we want to pray for him. Um, and for the family, um, and especially for just for his healing. Um, so let's uh, let's uh, bow in prayer. Father, we come to you as our good Father, as we just sang, and you delight to hear our prayers. As your children in this world, we live in a world that's so easy for us to be anxious, um, anxious about the virus that's currently afflicting afflicting the world. Anxious about getting sick, um, anxious about the state of our country, and anxious uh, about our loneliness uh, with desire to be together with relatives and friends. And your word teaches us to not to be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving that our requests be made known to you. So we come to you with thankful heart because we belong to you and you love and care for us. And we come to you with a request for our church, for Dawson and the Miller family, and for our sister's church, Maranatha Grace. Father, we want to pray for Dawson, um, this, uh, this young child. Uh, it's just sad to hear the suffering that he's been going through, um, the immense suffering with this rare complex disease called uh, autoimmune encephalitis. And as he goes through additional tests tomorrow, Lord, we pray that the doctors will be able to get a better diagnosis of the condition 
and be wise in providing the right treatment and pray that the treatment will work effectively in treating this, uh, his Dawson's condition. Father, we know that there are no molecules in our body that, that you do not know about. So we pray for your mercy and healing for over Dawson, that he will be healed of this, disease, this, uh, this terrible disease. We pray also for Ryan and Tanya that you continue to give them peace in the midst of this trial and help them to keep trusting in you as a loving father that knows and does all things for our good. Father, we, <clears throat> we want to also turn our attention to our sister church, Maranatha Grace, our partners in the gospel. Uh, in particular, we want to pray for uh, the current pastoral transition. Uh, we thank you for sustaining this church with their gospel witness during this past year. Thank you for calling Pastor Mike Malanga as your new teaching pastor. We pray that Pastor Mike will get adjusted to the area and the church quickly and come to love the people of the church and the people of this area. And pray that he will be faithful in his teaching, your word, in caring for the congregation, in discipling the people, and evangel in, in preaching faithfully and evangelizing the area as well, Lord. We pray that this change will continue to strengthen the gospel ministry and Maranatha Grace, strengthening, strengthening, strengthening the leadership and bringing further growth to Maranatha Grace in their holiness and in, in, in new converts and new believers coming to know the Lord. We pray also for the whole leadership team at Maranatha Grace, in particular for the elder team, to work well together with unity. And for those um, that I believe are currently going through the uh, new elder candidacy, including Eric Yang, who, who was here about a year ago, so preaching to us, we pray that he will continue to grow in, in, this, in his humble desire to serve as an elder and pray that the candidacy process and the vote next week will go well according to your will. We also pray that you continue to raise up additional leaders, both men and women, who desire to see your name glorified and who will serve humbly and with great joy. And as is the case in New Hope, we pray for the people at Maranatha Grace to continue to deepen their desire to grow in holiness and in love for Christ. So we pray for your protection over the church from sickness and for wisdom for the elders as they navigate and how best to shepherd the church during this pandemic. Father, for all of us, for those of us in New Hope and those at Maranatha Grace and those at Ryan Miller's church, help us to love one another, love our neighbors. Help us to forgive one another as Christ forgave us. Help us treat each other with grace instead of annoyance or anger, even, even when we have differences or especially when we have differences as Christ showed his grace while we were yet sinners. So we pray all these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior and loving King. Amen. Thank you, Jay. Um, today's uh, scripture comes from Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and both Malon and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. This is the word of God. Hi, New Hope. 
Thank you, Che, for leading us in prayer, brother. Let's, let's continue to pray for little Dawson Miller and for the whole Miller family as they walk through this extended season of pain and, 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 and suffering and uncertainty. Um, before we jump into God's Word today, I want to I wanna take just a moment to pray again. Pray for today, but also pray for our nation. As, as Chase said, we're coming in here on a Sunday after a, a week that's been filled with um, disturbing events, to say the least, unsettling and sad, troubling. What unfolded at the doors of the Capitol building this past week and in the hallways of the Capitol building on Wednesday was wicked. Let's not make any mistake about it. And what makes that wickedness even more disgusting is that there were many who were carrying out this attack on a government building and on government servants in the name of Jesus, waving signs that say, Jesus saves, and even erecting a giant cross in front of the Capitol building. Some of them even chanting, give it up if you believe in Jesus. Give it up if you believe in Donald Trump. Hopefully, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, something about this strikes us as wrong, as as a a blending of two things that should not meet. Something the Bible calls idolatry. A blending of Christianity and hope in Christ with hope in political ideology, political figures, leaders. I say this not to speak on behalf of political conservatism or progressivism at all, but rather just to point out something that perhaps we all need to be reminded of, that our hope is neither in conservatism or progressivism. Our hope is in no political party. Our hope is in Jesus Christ, the true and righteous one who died, who did not use his power and his authority to lead an insurrection, although many would have encouraged him to do so and did encourage him to do so, he refused. Instead, he laid down his life for his enemies. And this king, his rule is one of peace and unity and righteousness. And we gather today to worship him and him alone to help us and prepare us so that when we leave here, whatever our political beliefs may be, we continue to worship him and him alone in every area of our life. And so I want to invite you to pray with me for us as a church, but also for our nation. Let's pray to this king. Our God and Father, as you spoke about King Jesus, you said, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. But he will not cry out aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged until he has established justice in the earth and all the coastlands wait for his law. Lord Jesus, your kingdom is good news for a world that is caught in hostility. And so we ask that you would give us the grace we need for the deep challenges facing our country. We confess our anger, our deep sadness, our collective sense of weakness to see this world healed in our own strength. God, we, con- we honestly confess that, that our country has a long history of political division and opposition and a fight for power, which has been a strategy of evil powers and, and principalities. Lord, we confess that the gospel is good news for all of us. for the oppressed and the oppressor, for the politically empowered and the disenfranchised. Both, Lord, are raised up by the power of your gospel. Both can be liberated 
The oppressed are raised up from the harsh burden of oppression and inferiority, and the oppressor is raised up from the destructive illusion of power and superiority. Lord, we confess that the gospel is your power to form a new people that aren't identified by dominance or political power, but are identified by unity in the spirit, by meekness, by poverty of spirit, and a a thirst for righteousness. So Lord, we ask that you would help us name our part in our country's divisions and hostility. If we are participating in that division and hostility in some area, even in our own families or in our communities, in our own church, Lord, help us to own our part. Whether we have done evil or whether we have simply been silent in the face of evil, forgive us of our sin, O oh Lord. We pray for our enemies, for those who have allowed satanic powers to work through them. Grant them deliverance through your mighty power. And Lord, we ask that you would form us to be peacemakers and truth tellers. May we be people who speak the truth in love as we work for a reconciled world. Lord, we commit our lives to you, believing that you are working in the world in spite of destructive powers and principalities. Bring healing to those who are hurt. Bring peace to those who are anxious. And Lord, love to those who are fearful. We wait for you, O Lord. Make haste to help us. Make haste to make all things new. We ask you, our King. Amen. Thank you, Peter, for reading those opening words of the book of Ruth to us with all those difficult names of people and places. This short story of Ruth is captivating from beginning to end. It starts with famine and tragedy and death, and it ends with blessing and celebration and birth. In one sense, the story of Ruth is the story of someone who thinks she has lost everything, including hope, only to find out that God can redeem and restore all that is lost. In another sense, it's a story about leaving home and coming back home. You could also say that it's a story about love, but not the sort of love that you might expect. It is a love story, but not the kind that we're used to. In fact, some would say we shouldn't even call this a story, because as soon as you use that word story, some will think we mean fiction, a fairy tale, a legend, a tale. But this is history we're talking about here. These are real people, real hunger, real despair, real life. And so we could call it a narrative, a historical account. But those are accurate, but I'm not a fan of those words because although this is history, it's still one of the greatest stories ever told. It's been given to us by God for us to enjoy, yes, But like many stories, it also has something to teach us. In fact, it has a lot to teach us. The main characters in this story are a Jewish woman from Bethlehem named Naomi, her Moabite daughter-in-law, Ruth, and a relative of theirs, a man named Boaz. And unseen but everywhere in this story is Yahweh, the Lord, the God of Israel. He's mentioned a few times, but in a sense, it's very much his story. And because it's his story, composed by his sovereign hand, recorded and preserved for us, we can trust that this story has more to teach us than typical stories do. Ruth is here to show us the character and the heart of God to teach us who he is, how he rescues and redeems, how he works, how he loves. In fact, it's it's part of a much bigger story, Ruth is. 
And that bigger story is hinted at in the final lines of the story of Ruth. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's not jump there. Today, we are starting a new sermon series in the book of Ruth. It's just five sermons all together. But today, we're going to do something different from what we normally do, and different from even what I originally planned. All I want to do today is set up this series. And then in, the, in subsequent weeks, we will go through chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4 in consecutive Sundays. But today, God willing, but today, all we're going to do is set this series up. And the reason I want to take time to do this, well, this book may be familiar to you, but hopefully this will still be helpful. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a few reasons why the book of Ruth is so remarkable and, and why it's so worth reading now in 2021. And I want to invite you over the course of this next week to read Ruth, maybe read it more than once. It's very short. And to read it with some of these things in mind that we're going to talk about in a moment, to look for some of these themes in the story. Okay, so why Ruth? What's so remarkable about Ruth, the story, the book, and God's word? Well, the first thing is this. Ruth teaches us to trust God's word. Ruth teaches us to trust God's word. In this story, we encounter a desperate Jewish family from Bethlehem in Judah. Bethlehem, by the way, the name of that city means literally the house of bread or the house of food. But this family is driven to desperation by hunger because there is a famine in Bethlehem and in Judah. All of Israel has been engulfed in a famine, and this drives the members of this family to make some serious choices. And they make, in fact, a series of choices that run contrary to God's revealed will. That is, they disobey God's words, and frankly, it's understandable. It, they're making reasonable choices. It begins with leaving Judah to the land of Moab to find food, to survive. But tragically, all they find in Moab is more hunger and more loss. When it's only when Naomi realigns herself with God's revealed will that she begins slowly but dramatically to experience the blessing of God. The blessing of God that was actually waiting for her all along. And what she and, and Ruth together find is that God was ready and willing to receive and restore them long before they ever turned back to him. teaches us to trust and obey God's word. But this is more than just a story with a moral. Remember, these are, these are not characters in a movie. Their, their lives are an ancient testimony to the truth that God's word is trustworthy and authoritative and that what God calls us to is always wise and always good. So as we live through this unusual, uncertain discouraging, troubled time, Ruth can teach us to trust and follow God's words, even when obeying seems crazy, even when obeying and trusting hurts, even when it seems too hard. Secondly, Ruth teaches us to care for the poor, the vulnerable, and the outsider. Ruth teaches us to care for the poor, the vulnerable, and the outsider. Ruth is a Gentile woman from Moab, not a Jew. She travels, though, with Naomi, a Jewish woman, back to, from Moab, to the city of Bethlehem in Judah. Remember, they left Judah to go to Moab. What they found there was not food. They found tragedy and loss. And finally, of this whole family, the only two left are Naomi and Ruth, and they return to Bethlehem in Judah. For Naomi, Bethlehem is home. For Ruth, it's a foreign land. And she's not only going to live there as a foreigner, but she will have to live there as an impoverished, childless widow. And in Ruth's day, women were treated as possessions. And if they could not produce male offspring, they were often discarded. They were replaced with other women who could. So how much more vulnerable was a barren woman in a foreign country 
with no money. In the ancient world where wealth and nationality were, were the primary contributors to security and quality of life. But what we find when these two women come back to Judah is that God's law had made provisions for the needs of foreigners and widows in Israel. And while those particular laws aren't directly applicable to us today, they still reveal God's heart to us. And along with, the, and along with those laws in the, the book of Ruth, we get the example that we're going to see in a few weeks of a man named Boaz. The generosity and the care of a man named Boaz towards a childless, foreign, impoverished widow. And between God's law and the example of Boaz, they can help together, can help us see more clearly how we, as God's people, are called not just to care for her, but to welcome and love the poor and the vulnerable in our communities. Ruth teaches us to love the poor, the vulnerable, the outsider. That's another reason we want to study this book. Thirdly, Ruth teaches us about the interplay between God's sovereignty and our actions. God's sovereignty and our actions and how they interplay. Like I said, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of Israel, is active throughout this whole story. All the events and the coincidences that, that change Naomi and Ruth's lives are not coincidences at all. Naomi consistently acknowledges that the hand of God is moving. At times, she might misunderstand what God is doing or why he's doing it, but she knows that he's doing something. She knows that he's in control. He is sovereign. He is ruling over all things. But at the same time that we see his sovereign work, his sovereign hand at work, we also see that the actions of Naomi and Ruth and Boaz, they all have repercussions, both good and bad, consequences. God is no puppet master in this story or in any other story in this book. These people are responding to their circumstances. Sometimes they're doing that wisely, sometimes not so wisely, but they exercise their will, for better or for worse, and at the same time, all the while, God is accomplishing his purposes with and through their actions. Whether it's to bless or it's to discipline, whether it's to give or to take away. And so we're left with this beautiful picture of how God sovereignly rules, even while we are responsible for the choices and steps we take. We'll see again that God is hardly mentioned as, as acting in Ruth. But he's moving throughout to restore Naomi and to restore her family. In fact, there are times we'll see when it seems that God is disciplining them and moving to restore at the same time. We see that, we'll see that early on, even as, as, as early as next week. It teaches us that when God does one thing, he's doing a million things. And that challenges us. It challenges our simplistic ways of looking at God's providence. That is, looking at how God works in the world. We, we tend to look simplistically sometimes. We, we, we ask, why did this happen in my life? Why did that happen in their life? There must be a reason. There must be a reason. God must be doing something. No, God is doing a million things most of which we will not even understand, maybe until later, maybe only in eternity. Through one event, the departure of this family from Judah to Moab, and through Naomi's decision to return, and through Ruth's decision, as we'll see next week, to go with Naomi and stick with her. All these individual decisions in each one, God is accomplishing many things. Now, the book of Ruth doesn't explain all that to us. It doesn't untangle God's purposes. 
It doesn't give us all the answers, but it shows us the wisdom and the beauty of God's providence in, in ways that should drive us to worship him as Lord and trust him with our future. It, Ruth teaches us to realize that when we're suffering or if we're celebrating, we're in the middle of a much bigger story. And we won't know how it works out until it works out. Ruth teaches us patience in the middle of that story. It teaches us to trust God with our future. That leads to number four. Number four, Ruth teaches us about suffering. Teaches us about suffering. Although God is everywhere in this account, at points we can struggle to see him. So I want to I even invite you this week as you read through Ruth, look for God. Where is he? He's not always in plain sight, but he's still there. He, at times we struggle to stay, we can struggle to see him in Ruth, but you know why? Well, that's just like in our own lives. We can struggle to see him in our own lives, although he is there and he is working. In our pain and our hardship, sometimes we struggle to see where is he. Ruth reaches us teaches us that God is not absent in our struggles. He's with his people, and he will not abandon us, ever, even when we respond badly to our struggles. Even when we respond with anger or with hopelessness, he never bails. Ruth gives us a theology of suffering, but not the way we might expect it. If we want to see what Ruth teaches about suffering, we got to glean it from the story. As we watch these women filled with desperation and anguish, experiencing the torture of loss. If we look closely enough at them, we will learn something about walking with God through pain and hardship now in 2021. Fifthly and lastly, Ruth teaches us about the steadfast loving kindness of God. Ruth teaches us about the steadfast, loving kindness of God. There is one important Hebrew word that shows up three times over the course of this story. It's the word hesed. Hesed. The English transliteration is usually spelled H-E-S-E-D. And usually it's translated in the Bible as kindness. In the book of Ruth, that's the way it's translated. Kindness. Although it only shows up three times in this book, the concept of hesed, it, it permeates the entire story. And so as we go through this sermon series, I'm hoping that the idea of hesed will just echo in our heads again and again and again. It permeates the whole narrative. It can be a hard word for us to understand because it doesn't translate easily into English. It shows up a lot throughout the Bible, but it's translated differently throughout the Bible. You know why? Because it's so hard for us to find an English word that really captures it. So sometimes it's translated as kindness, like it is here in Ruth. Sometimes it's translated as loving kindness or steadfast love. Sometimes people just uh, call it faithfulness or devotion. All those words, they get at some part of the meaning, but none of those words really does it justice because hesed is too deep. It's too rich. It, it has a range of meaning that doesn't fit well in any one English word. But when we look at the concepts that this word describes throughout the Bible, what we will see is a beautiful picture of a love unlike any other. A love that is committed, that is steadfast, that is endures it never stops. It never ends. It is costly love. It is sacrificial love. It is self-denying love. And it's the kind of love that characterizes Yahweh, the Lord, the God of Israel. The word hesed is found all over the Psalms, for instance. For example, in uh, Psalm 136, we'll just look at it briefly. Psalm 136 Is, um, it's a pretty repetitive psalm in some ways, beautifully repetitive. It starts this way. 
Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. His hesed endures forever. Why should we give thanks? How do we know he is good? Because his hesed endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his hesed endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him alone, to him alone does great wonders. To who alone does great wonders? For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who made the great lights, the sun to rule over the day, the moon to rule over the night. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, for his, head, his steadfast love endures forever. Who brought Israel from among them, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea for his steadfast love endures forever. And as we jump through, we just see more and more. Verse 17, to him who struck down great kings for his steadfast love endures forever. And gave their land as a heritage for his steadfast love endures forever. It's he who remembered us in our low estate for his steadfast love endures forever and rescued us from our foes and give us food, gives food to all flesh for his steadfast love endures forever. You see, everything that God has done from creation to redemption to caring for us to feeding us, it's all rooted in his hesed love. It's all an example of his steadfast loving kindness to us his people. And Ruth is a testament to that. To the fact that the Lord's love never stops. It never gives up. And it's bound up in his covenant with his people. You see, this Hesed love is not an emotion. This Hesed love is willful, active, unstopping. We take action until we get tired and we must stop. God's has said love is continually moving towards us, continually actively pushing towards us, enveloping us, providing for us without pause, without rest, and it will never, ever stop. Because he's made a covenant with his people, a promise that is unbreakable. This is a committed love that binds us to God and it will not break. Also, another thing about this Hesed love, it's undeserved. And I said it's active. You know what that also means? It means it's visible. It's visible love. That's what the psalmist points in, in, in Psalm 136. Whether it's through creation or redeeming his people from Egypt or redeeming us from our sins or providing for us every day, feeding us. In all these ways, God is visibly doing hesed to us, as the Bible puts it. You know, it's really not a stretch to say that the whole Bible is a story of God showing his hesed to his people. Or as the Bible often puts it, like I said, doing hesed to his people. And that's the story of Ruth, too. It's why we can call this a love story. A real love story. Not because it's about a man and a woman finding each other and finding happiness together, although that's beautiful, but because it's a story of God's unstopping love for people who at times feel and, and truly are hopeless. This kind of love is a love that we can only find in its purest, perfect form in God alone. And yet, what we see in Ruth is we see people showing Hesed love to each other. Like when Ruth, we'll see next week, binds herself to Naomi and says, where you go, I go. Your God will be my God. I will never leave you or forsake you. What is that? But it's Ruth, imperfectly, but beautifully displaying Hesed love, the love of God towards this woman. It's an overflow of the Hesed covenant love that she's received from God. It's pouring out towards this woman, her mother-in-law. And that's vital for us to see because this shows us that sometimes the way that God shows his hesed love is through other people. 
and the way he desires New Hope to show his love to other people is through us. It's through you. We receive it vertically for the purpose of enjoying it and relishing it and for the purpose of giving it, doing it horizontally. Ruth has so much to teach us about loving other people in a way that's completely different from what our culture considers to be love. Ruth can show us not only how that God has loved us, but how we can love others if the Spirit of God lives in us. As God's children, if you have believed in Jesus Christ, you have been adopted into the family of God. He is your good, good Father. And because you are His child, you are being changed more and more to be like him, to to be shaped by that family resemblance. And because you're being shaped to be more like him, you can and you need to pour out his hesed love on others. We need to, and we can, if the Spirit of God lives in us, imperfectly, but truly and visibly even in our messiest relationships, even in our most difficult relationships, our most frustrating relationships, even when, even when our love is rejected or when our words are rejected or when we are rejected. Brothers and sisters, no matter what happens in your life, God's steadfast love to you will not be broken. His hesed clings to you forever, just like Ruth cling, clung to Naomi in chapter one. And the more we experience and understand that love, the more we're going to be able to do that love. I know it's an awkward way to say it, but it's intentional. It's doing hesed. It's doing love. In a world where people bail, They quit, write each other off, cancel. This is love without an exit strategy. This is love with no trap doors. It's a love that stays, that pursues, and doesn't give up. The clearest picture of that hesed love, of that merciful loving kindness in Ruth comes at the climax of this story in chapter 4 when a man named Boaz, who we're told is a man of noble character. What a great description, huh? How many of you men would love to be regarded as, recorded in history as a man of noble character, a woman of noble character? Well, Boaz, he redeems Ruth. We'll see what that means. But suffice it to say for now that this barren, impoverished outsider is approached by Boaz who rescues and marries her at great cost to himself. It's a radical decision that Boaz makes, and it's motivated by kindness and grace, and it results in blessing for him For Ruth, for Naomi, it results in blessing for all of us. It resulted in blessing for all. When she bore a child from that marriage with Boaz, it resulted in blessing for all of us and hope for the world. When we read Ruth at a surface level, I think some people have read it over, over the years, we can read it as if, oh, here's the happy story. Here's the hope. Ruth found a man, they got married, they had a baby. That's the point of life. That's beautiful, yay. That's not the point of life. And yes, that's beautiful, but that's certainly not the point of this story. And that's not where the hope comes from. The point is not, and the goal as we read this is not to walk away valuing more. Oh yes, it's important to find a man and have a baby. That's not the point. Or to find a woman and have a baby. No, no. No, that's not what God wants us to ultimately value and treasure in this story. What he wants us to see in that super happy ending is what we come across in the very last lines 
of the story. I know we haven't read any of it. Peter read the first few lines. I'm going to read the last couple of lines. Ruth chapter 4, verse 19. Well, let's start at 17. No, we'll start at 19. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. That's our man. That's, that's, that's the protagonist here, one of them. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse Father David. And if we continue this line down, we find that what comes from this root, from this branch, from this line of David is Jesus himself, the redeemer of the world. All because Boaz redeemed a Moabite woman, an outsider, hopeless and impoverished. And with her, they give birth to this one. They name him Obed. And Obed has a baby named Jesse, and Jesse's a sheep farmer, and he gives birth to a, a boy named David, who's also a shepherd, and that boy becomes king of Israel, and that boy, as prophesied, brings into the world, through his lineage, the Savior, the Redeemer of the world. So if you've trusted in Jesus, the story of Ruth is your story too. It's my story. It's our story. We've been grafted into this story. We were all born as outsiders to God's kingdom, just like Ruth. God sent us a redeemer. Better than Boaz. A more noble character. That righteous Redeemer, Jesus Christ, he purchased us at the cost of his life. And he married us. Binds us to himself by covenant. He is our groom, and by covenant, we receive his hesed love. And because we are his, and he will not leave us or forsake us, his hesed love will not allow that to happen. We can continue to enjoy his care his redemption, his restoring. He will bring us back again and again and again as we stray. So why are we studying Ruth? Why is Ruth so remarkable? Those are some reasons. I invite you over the course of the next several days to read through this book, maybe again multiple times. Look for this in it. Look for how Ruth teaches you to trust God's word. Look at how Ruth teaches you about suffering about caring for the outsider, the vulnerable, the poor. Garu teaches you about the interplay between the decisions you make and God's sovereign rule. And most of all, look at what God teaches you through Ruth about his steadfast love to you. I'm excited to study this book together, brothers and sisters. I hope that you and I walk through this book and come out on the other side experiencing more and doing more of this head said love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the accounts, these stories that you give us that are, that are better than anything the world can give us. We love them. We're captivated by them. But Lord, we don't just want to enjoy them. We want to be transformed uh, bring us in, suck us into the reality of this narrative and transform us as we see who you are and what you are doing in the details of these lives that are marked by despair and trouble and by celebration and joy and blessing. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Let's rise and respond.
within the sorrow there is beauty in our tears and you meet us in our morning with a love that cast down me you are working in Thank you for leading in us in that song. He is indeed sovereign over us. I don't know if you noticed, but there's a little lyric change in that song. Do you guys notice that? We sing, we usually sing, the song usually says, even what the enemy meant for evil, the song goes, you turned it for our good. I think that's how it usually goes, isn't it? You know what we sang? We didn't sing that. We sang, even what the enemy meant for evil, you mean it for our good. There's a difference. Think about that. What's the difference? 
God just doesn't take what the enemy does and, and turn it around and flip it for our good. From the beginning, he has meant it. <laughs> the very actions meant to harm us, God has meant them from before time for our good. This is a fitting word for us to end with. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. We love you, Lord Jesus.